beloved, and welcome to worship with us here at St. Martin's Lutheran Church. It is good to be with you, wherever you happen to be coming to us from. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. As we worship together today, we invite you, as always, to have bread and wine or grape juice with you, so that we can share in the Eucharist together, even as we are apart. Now, beloved, let us begin our worship with confession. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance, and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us now live in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 I invite you to join your hearts and voices with us in our gathering song, Baptized and Set Free. Mold us into a people 
who welcome your word and serve one another through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from the sixth chapter of the book of Romans, beginning with the twelfth verse. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know if you will present yourself to another as obedient slaves, your sins to one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which you now are ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wage of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel, according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, whoever welcomes you, welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace be to you from God our Creator and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, when we were living in New York, Ryan, her mother and I, would take a week-long trip around July 4th to visit my relatives in Michigan. That first year, we planned everything out meticulously. Because Ryan was only about six months old and we'd never really traveled with a baby before. And so we knew every stop we were going to make, where we would eat, where we would sleep, everything. And everything really went quite smoothly. The stops we'd chosen were just the right distance before needing to stretch our legs. The hotel in Michigan had a nightly milk and cookie delivery. And we even found a church on our way back where we could worship. Best of all, perhaps Ryan was an excellent traveler. And she spent most of the time when we were on the road asleep both the two days driving out and the two days driving home. Well, one of the days driving home. On that last day of the trip, everything was going just as expected when we found ourselves caught in a horrendous traffic jam just outside of Port Jervis, New York. And that was about the time Ryan woke up and decided she was done with all this traveling. There is a little red preschool building 
just off the highway that will forever be burned in my mind because it was next to us for what seemed like an eternity. We were finally able to pull off the highway into a small town where we learned that someone had hit a power transformer, bringing traffic to a dead halt and knocking out power to the town. It took five hours to make those last 90 miles home, and Ryan hollered the whole time. And we swore that next time we would do things different. The next year, we took the trip again, and we didn't do a blessed thing different. Same restaurants, same hotels, same milk and cookies, same place of worship. We were thinking everything had gone pretty well indeed as we cruised down I-84, but then we came into a construction area and traffic began to slow. And then it stopped. And I looked out the passenger window and saw a distinctive red preschool building. We crept forward a few more agonizing miles, and as we did, more familiar sights came into view. We were stuck in the exact same place we had been the year before. The only difference, to my knowledge, is that this time there was no blown transformer. We ended up getting off the highway at the same exit, taking the same detour and hearing much of the same hollering as we had the year before. You would think once would be enough to learn, wouldn't you? But the truth is, it's a pretty common human experience to repeat our mistakes. We all know the old familiar proverbs, those who don't learn their history are doomed to repeat it. And the definition of insanity is to do the same thing, but expect different results. But we all know what it's like to go back and do it again. Maybe you've woken up the night after indulging a bit too much and sworn for the hundredth time that you're never drinking that much again until the next weekend rolls around. Maybe you've had food poisoning and thought there's no way you'll ever eat that again, but Gosh, it just tastes so good. And surely being sick was a one-off. Maybe you've been in a relationship where you were not treated well and you swore this would be the last time they'd treat you like that, but then they apologized and said they really meant it this time. Or maybe you've listened to an angry six-month-old scream for five solid hours and promised you would find another way home only to look out the window and find yourself exactly where you'd been before. I imagine that last one might just be me. But you know, this morning I get a bit of deja vu, reading Paul's words to the Romans. We pick up right where we left off, in the middle of the sixth chapter, and Paul is asking the same question he did in our reading last week. Should we sin because we are not under law but under grace? But where at the start of the chapter, Paul talked about new life through baptism, here he is talking about how we are to live after we have been baptized. Yes, we are washed clean in that bath of new birth, but what are we to do then? It is a question worth pondering, because I still hear people ask a version of this question today. If Jesus died for all my sins, then why does it matter what I do? I'm already forgiven, so why should I change anything about my life? And Paul would answer that we are slaves to whomever we obey, whether sin or God. Last week I said there is a difference between believing in Jesus and following Jesus, and that is the difference between conversion and discipleship. And this week, we make another shift with Paul from redemption to sanctification. That is, we are making the move from forgiveness to reconciliation. You see, Paul would not deny that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection set the world free from sin, death, and the power of the devil. He agrees. 
But so often we talk about this living, dying, and rising of Christ as though it were just an event that took place 2,000 years ago. In that moment, we were redeemed. We were forgiven. But Paul understands that this living, dying, and rising of Christ is still happening in our very hearts. That every choice we make, to be obedient to sin increases the brokenness of this world. But every choice we make to be obedient to God participates in the healing of this world. Sanctification. The process of being made holy is about how we live our lives in response to having been saved by grace through faith. Paul reminds us, church, that there was a time when we were enslaved to sin because we simply did not know another way. But having been baptized into death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have been set free from ignorance. We have in the Holy Scriptures a love letter that expresses God's deepest desire for the human race. That we love, honor, and serve both God and our neighbors. We have in the life of Jesus of Nazareth an example that shows what love looks like. Caring for the poor, tending to the sick, and giving what is ours by right for the sake of our responsibility to others. And we have in the 2,000 year history of the church a tradition of self-sacrificial service. Sometimes lived out well and other times not so much. The church is at its best when it remembers that, as the Reverend Dr. Gordon Lathrop says, tradition is not the preservation of ashes, but the passing on of fire. In times when it seems like the world is on fire, obedience to sin often ends up being obedience to self. Seeking to save what is comfortable and nostalgic from all that would threaten the way we've always done it. At those same times, obedience to God is seeing that the fires raging are a chance to reignite the faith in our hearts and share that warmth and glow with those whose hearts are cold and whose way seems lost. A quote attributed to the modern day poet and prophet Maya Angelou says it this way, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. Once we were slaves to sin and we did not know better, we would find ourselves always back in the same place. But as baptized believers and disciples of Jesus Christ, we have the law and the prophets, the gospels and epistles to guide us in right living. You shall love your neighbor as yourself is at the very heart of Leviticus in the law of Moses. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God, asks the prophet Micah. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another, commanded our Lord, as he sat at table with his disciples for the last time. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others, Paul writes to the church in Philippi. These voices and so many others cry out throughout scripture and across time to remind us that when we live only for ourselves, we deepen the divides in this world. But when we live for one another, we begin to heal what sin has broken as God works through our actions to bring beauty out of ashes and lead us into a new and promised future. Beloved, we are living in one of those times when the world seems to be on fire. We had hoped to return to in-person worship today, but as we have seen COVID spread again at an alarming rate, and hospital beds become full and mask orders and stay home orders be put into place, it seemed the responsible thing to delay once more, and I am grieving that loss with you. 
And it is right and okay to grieve that loss. But knowing that the lives of our neighbors are being affected physically, emotionally, financially, and spiritually, may we also be active in doing the things that serve life. Wearing masks and keeping our distance when we go out for the sake of the other. Calling to check in with friends and acquaintances who may be feeling lonely or frustrated. Supporting those who are struggling by providing what assistance we can. And being living examples of hope as we engage this health crisis through faith. As disciples of Christ who are obedient to God, we know that faith and hope and love are not ideas, but they are actions. And when we know better, we are called to do better. And perhaps our social media feeds are returning to normal after weeks of unrest in the wake of the death of George Floyd and so many others but the quieting of those voices does not equate to the easing of the pain nor a solution to the challenges that have plagued our country. We have heard the voices of our black and brown siblings crying out for justice. We have heard the voices of our LGBTQ siblings crying out for equality. We have heard the voices of indigenous peoples crying out for recognition. We have heard the voices of immigrants crying out for hope. We have heard the voices of the poor cry out for relief. Those voices still cry out today, even if they are not visible in our news feeds. And it is okay to feel overwhelmed by the depth of hurt or the strength of anger being expressed by those who are hurting. But knowing that so many of our beloved siblings are carrying deep wounds, may we not ignore their cries for help. May we listen with compassion and learn from their lived experience. May we raise our voices for justice when our siblings' throats are raw. May we seek to educate ourselves about the hurts we do not understand, and may we show up for the ones that we know all too well. As disciples of Christ, who are obedient to God, we know that justice, peace, and reconciliation are not ideas, but they are actions. And when we know better, we are called to do better. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus sets a pretty high bar for us to live up to. And in truth, we know that in this life, we will not be perfect. If we could do that on our own, we would not have been in such desperate need of grace. But we are not permitted to use that as an excuse to stop working to find ourselves back in the same place we began. Sanctification is a process of becoming more like the God whom we serve, and it happens one act of love at a time. It can start with something as simple as a cup of cold water to ease the thirst of one of God's beloved children. Do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. Grace has set us free from sin and taught us the heart of God. May we have such a living, acting, daring faith so as to strive each day to do better to the glory of God and to the healing of this world. Amen.
gathered into one body with the Holy Spirit, let us confess the faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. God of companionship, encourage our relationships with our siblings in Christ. Bless our conversations, shape our shared future, and give us hearts eager to join in a festal shout of praise. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of abundance, you make your creation thrive and grow to provide all that we need. Inspire us to care for our creation and your and be attuned to where the earth is crying out. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of mercy, your grace is poured out for all. Inspire authorities, judges, and politicians to act with compassion. Teach us to overcome fear with hope, meet hate with love, and wel welcome one another as we would welcome you. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of care, accompany all who are in deepest need. Comfort those who are sick, lonely, or isolated. Strengthen those who are in prison or awaiting trial. Renew the spirits of all who call upon you. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of community, we give thanks for this congregation. Give us passion to embrace your mission and the vision to recognize where you are leading us. Teach us how to live more faithfully with each other. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Lord, you know our needs even before we ask. Today we lift before you Michael, Anna Marie, Al, Pat, Jeff, David, Barbara, Jean, Mitzi, James, John, Dawn, Ruth, Danny, Mona, Terry, Dave, Dawn, Molly, Kelly, Adam, Millie, and all those we name before you aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of love, you gather in your embrace all who have died. Keep us steadfast in our faith and renew our trust in your promise. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
we prepare to receive the Eucharist together, we remember that on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. All are welcome at the Lord's table. Taste and see that the Lord is good. body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Now may this body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace unto life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Beloved, receive the benediction. Neither death, nor light, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Amen. We invite you to join your hearts and voices with us in our closing hymn, Give to Our God Immortal Praise. Thank you. 
Beloved, in a world that is short on peace, may you have the peace of God. May you know the peace of God, and may you live the peace of God. May that peace of God be with you always. And also with you. May you share that peace in any way you can with everyone you can. Amen. Amen. Amen.